Now for the head to toe assessment, we're gonna be covering all the top stuff that you might see during the clinical setting. And it might depend on your hospital or facility. So this is what's common in our field. So for the eyes, ears, nose, and throats, the biggest thing with the eyes that you're probably gonna see, especially with our elderly population, glycoma, you're gonna see a cloudy eye. And now for cataracts, you'll see a blue halo on the perimeter of the eye. Now, if the patient did have cataract surgery, it's gonna look like metal prongs inside the eye. Now, the other thing you might see is also liver disease patients. They're gonna have jaundice in the sclera, so right on the whitening of the eye and even under the bottom of the eyelid for cirrhosis as well as hepatitis patients. Now, moving on to the ears, when we start looking inside the ears, one of the biggest things is an earache, redness inside the ear canal upon inspection. You'll also have a diagnosis of Meniere's disease, which is basically fluid inside the ears. Just think my ears disease. You lose a little bit of balance because of the fluid in your ears. So jumping to the throat real quick, the top two things we usually see is strep throat, which are just like white splotches in the back of the throat, as well as an inflamed uvula. Now for the nose, you might see a little bit of crusties and you wanna make sure to clean your patient up. But you also get dry mucous membranes, especially if patients are on long-term oxygen therapy. Now, since we're in the throat and mouth area, we'll have the patient smile, and this is to assess uh, a stroke or even a history of a stroke. If the patient has one-sided weakness on one of the smiles, just like this, then it typically means either a new stroke or a history of an old stroke. Next is the gums. So we'll have the patient smile real big, and if the gums are inflamed or even red, bleeding, typically means gingivitis. Oral thrush is a fungal infection, which is a white coating of the tongue. We typically see that when a patient is taking steroids or inhaling steroids for a respiratory issue. Now, if the tongue is red and beefy, then it typically means pernicious anemia, so a B12 deficiency. Now, moving on to the neck here, one of the biggest assessments is for JVD, which is basically jugular vein distension. This is typically for our fluid volume overload patients who are in heart failure exacerbation. Fancy words for worsening heart failure. So just remember, HF for heart failure, HF for heavy fluid. If your patient is reclined, it'll put a lot more pressure and have it protrude more. Now, another thing you'll find is the lymph nodes. For lymphoma, you'll see enlarged lymph nodes and painless lumps even on the side of the armpit and the axilla, but usually in this area. Now, for thyroid, a big one is a goiter. We usually have a grapefruit-sized neck that's just protruding right here. Now, if a patient does have a history of a thyroidectomy, you'll see a surgical scar right over here. Now, the fourth thing you might see in this area is either a trach as well as even tracheal deviation, which is typically from a pneumothorax, where the entire trach gets pushed to the side. Now next, moving down to the cardiac area, and make sure to assess for murmurs, as well as big, huge, clunky pacemakers. The top five lung sounds to write down and know is number one, crackles, Number two, wrong guy. Number three, plural friction rub, which I call pebble friction rub because it sounds like two pebbles being grinded together. The strider squeak, which is, <laughs> yes, just like that. Sounds like a squeaky door or a squeaky toy. And number five is wheezes, which we call the wheezy whistle. Now that's common after asthma or asthma attacks. Now the top diagnosis in the lung area is typically COPD. Now patients with COPD, they have a lot of air trapping, so they're gonna have a huge barrel chest. Another thing you might find with trauma patients is a flail chest, where you basically have a rib fracture 
that protrudes out when the patient's breathing. Now, hemothorax and pneumothorax. For hemothorax, blood might fill up this lung space, so we'll hear diminished lung sounds, as well as dull resonance upon percussion when we tap it. Now, for pneumothorax, you have air inside the lung space. You'll hear diminished lung sounds, and you have hyper percussion. So it's almost like you're tapping on an empty paint can or a hollow tree. Inside the pneumothorax, it's just gonna fill it up like a big, huge drum. Here's the biggest thing when assessing the abdomen. We always look first, listen second, and then feel or palpate last. Now, if we don't hear bowel sounds, then we listen for a full five minutes. Now, number one thing, the most critical thing, is a triple A. So if we see a large pulsating mass, it's basically the aorta right there that is bulging. We do not want to touch that. It's like a ticking time bomb. If we touch it, it might explode, the patient's gonna die and bleed out. Now the second biggest thing is the right lower quadrant. And if you guys guessed it, it is appendicitis. So the patient has a really sharp pain in the right lower quadrant with rebound tenderness, then that is typical of appendicitis. Number three is cholecystitis, which is gallbladder inflammation. So in the right upper quadrant, so right over here, the upper quadrant. Now this pain radiates to the right shoulder. So if you hear right upper quadrant pain that radiates to the right shoulder, it's cholecystitis. Now number four is a colostomy and an ileostomy. For a stoma assessment, we want pink and moist stoma. That is huge, never purple, never gray or never even blue or dusky. And lastly, number five is a small bowel obstruction, an SBO. We typically hear hyperactive bowel sounds above the obstruction, wherever it is, and hypoactive bowel sounds, or basically low bowel sounds, below the obstruction. Now, since we're in the abdominal area, a urinary assessment is also necessary. So for men, we have BPH, that benign prosthetic hyperplasia or hypertrophy. So we see urinary urgency as well as frequency and trouble starting a stream. Now for UTIs, that urinary tract infection, we can also see burning upon urination. Well, what if the patient has a Foley? So the really biggest thing with a Foley is making sure the patient doesn't get a UTI because bacteria can climb up that Foley and into the bladder. Now for extremities, is assessing for hemodialysis shunts, which are gonna be right here on either side, as well as the PMSC. PMSC is the pulses, motor, sensation, and circulation of the hands and the feet, basically the extremities. Now, going down here toward the feet, one of the biggest things we will see is edema, which is basically that memory foam bed. It can be plus one to plus four, this is typical of fluid volume overload or even heart failure patients. They just have a lot of dependent fluid here. We'll show a picture of diabetic feet. We'll see open sores on the toes and even the bottom of the feet, which leaves the patient at high risk for infection and gangrene leading to amputation. Now the last two things you might see on the extremities is PVD and PAD, that peripheral vascular insufficiency. Basically meaning that blood can't get down and back up to the lower extremities. So we might see varicose veins as well as shiny red hairless legs. And very lastly, on the big toes, you also have, might have gout patients. So we see red joints in the big toes. All right, now finally is the big skin assessment. Oh good, I've been waiting for that. You know what, I don't know why? <laughs> because I have a lot of moles. Should I be worried about them? Yeah, so Whenever you're assessing the skin, we can do it at any time for the head-to-toe assessment. You're gonna be all over this patient's body and just assessing. We always wanna make sure we're turning the patient, making sure we note any type of moles, any type of disformity. Remember, specifically for moles, anything that has irregular borders is not regular. So if it looks irregular, it's definitely irregular. We should report those things. So first things first, we talked about it all the time, but really a common finding is liver disease patients, either cirrhosis, hepatitis, uh, we'll see jaundice, that yellow skin. We might even see pruritus, that itchy skin from all those bile salts. Number two is the bleeding. So if your patient's on anticoagulants, or let's say they have hemophilia, we wanna assess the patient for bruises and even petechiae, those little red dots all over the body. Another one, especially for our elderly patients, is dry skin. 
We have flaky, cracked skin, and even possibly yeast infections from fungal infections. Now, we also see eczema, which is a chronic disorder of skin, which the skin becomes red and itchy and dry. Now, an autoimmune disorder called psoriasis is also very common, where the body attacks normal healthy tissue, and a key sign is silver plaques and reddening skin that's roughed and raised and even flat on top. Now, for all our sports players, fungal infection called ringworm is very common infection. And a really gross one, now Kat has probably seen this in the clinical setting, is scabies, which are those little bugs that go underneath the skin and cause a lot of itching. I'm out. <laughs> Trust me, once you get your first patient with scabies, it feels like you have scabies. And very lastly, we have shingles, also called herpes zoster, caused by a reactivation of varicella zoster, which is the same virus that causes chickenpox. So this rash runs horizontally along the right side and left side of the torso, typically presenting as crusting or even pustular. All right, guys, that wraps it up for the top most frequent things you'll find on a head-to-toe assessment. Hopefully this video was helpful. Thanks, Kat. Thank you.